So yeah. Do you see it recording? On the top left? Uh, no, I don't see anything. There should be like a red. Oh, I, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I see. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm going to introduce you first. I can edit all this out. Um, okay. Aloha. Aloha, thank you guys for coming to our uh, Thursday Hanama Talks um, via online. Um, to the, today, we are, our, um, I'll be pre today's presenter is uh, Susan Scott, and she'll be talking about the miracle of Midway, a million albatrosses, and counting. So, without uh, further ado, Susan Scott. Hey, thank you, Gavin. Um, well, one of the uh, things I wanted to say, first of all, is that I noticed in Gavin's announcement that it says Dr. Susan Scott, and I, I do not have a doctorate. And so uh, I don't want to take credit for something I didn't earn. But uh, I do feel like I've earned the right to talk about Midway because I've been there so many times. I've been visiting since 1988 for various reasons as a, a biologist and a journalist, a volunteer. And also my husband was a doctor out there for a little while as a substitute doctor. And so I went with him. But anyway, one of the things that I, I've done uh, several times, I think this was my sixth, sixth time this last um, December and January was to count albatrosses and the big question is how do you count a million albatrosses because there really are that many so I'm going to tell you the story here uh, first of all what you do is you get a, a bunch of volunteers for the US Fish and Wildlife Service and that's sort of a an organized uh, list that's uh, you can apply online a lot of us have done it several times because it sometimes takes some experience but not not always and then you uh, get them to agree to pay their own airfare because Fish and Wildlife does not have money anymore to, to do this uh, count. We did uh, years and years ago, but that's uh, no longer. And the, uh, this is the group that went out with us this year. We, we were short several because there is an airplane seat shortage, but we uh, managed to do the count anyway. The other thing that we need this year <laughs> for the first time is snowshoes. And I will tell you why we have snowshoes. It's a pretty funny thing to think that we're going to Midway. We uh, each have a little counter that one of the biologists who organizes this calls a tallywhacker. And we hold one in each hand, one's for uh, lace and albatrosses and one is for black-footed albatrosses, the two species there. And then we go out and we count. And the joke is, how do you count a million albatrosses? One, two, three, four. <laughs> And so I'll tell you what we're doing here. It's a pretty interesting um, way, way of counting. First of all, Midway is about 1,200 miles from Honolulu. It's way out on the end of the Northwest chain. And it takes uh, several hours, depending on what kind of plane we have to get there. So people have to pay their own way to get to Honolulu. And those of us who are lucky enough to live here pay our charter flight to Midway. Round trip is about $2,500. And that includes food there. So we were there for a month, so it's not really a uh, ridiculous price, but it's still quite a bit of money. Uh, Midway is sometimes called Midway Island by the military, but it is in fact an atoll. And the main island is Sand Island that we uh, stay on and it's larger. Eastern Island uh, was a big thing, part of World War II and those are uh, grown over runways. That's what the gray strips are there was runways. So Midway has an interesting history. In 1903, it was the Pacific Cable Company because in the first cables, you had to have relays. So it went from San Francisco to Honolulu to Midway to Japan. That's how the cable uh, wires went around the world. So this was a really big thing in 1903. You can see there's still some buildings there that are way beyond repair. And so they're gradually falling apart. But it's an interesting part of being there is seeing this. Of course, we all know the Battle of Midway was during World War II. And this is one of the buildings that the Navy had that still has bullet holes in the side. And so that is also deteriorating. There's kind of a controversy of whether to spend a really lot of money to, to keep these buildings standing or to gradually let them go until they have to be torn down. I think a lot of them are getting torn down. The Navy called it, as I said, Midway Island. And in 1988, uh, up here, it set, uh, became the overlay for the National Wildlife Refuge and that meant the Navy was there, but it was still a wildlife refuge. They uh, combined the, their, their efforts. 
And as you can see back here on the right, that it's, this is the Navy part that always had albatrosses. Albatrosses were always a part of this island, atoll island, islands in the atoll, no matter what was going on. And then there's Midway uh, overlay, and um, that just meant the, that both, and that's the first time I came when, when they had a ceremony of giving the, the, the Navy giving the uh, atoll the, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And to, it's been through several other changes. It's now, Midway is now a wildlife refuge, national memorial, and a um, national marine monument. And that's uh, one of the reasons that um, the place has gotten some money because it's a memorial to renovate some of the buildings. Not all of them, but these, these are the houses originally designed by a famous architect that were renovated not too long ago. And this is where people who uh, live on Midway get to live. It's, it's really a, uh, nice houses. Little white picket fences. It's kind of a 1950s, 60s um, atmosphere. Very charming. And you can see there's birds all over. The, the birds own it, but uh, they try to keep them out of the vegetable gardens at least. We visitors and volunteers uh, stay in the former uh, officers' quarters called Charlie Barracks, and that's behind us. And uh, the albatrosses are having a little dance in front. There's one, they're all nesting around you, so you have this uh, sort of nice song and dance going on throughout the stay. This is the interior. It's uh, very comfortable places. Sorry if you can hear my uh, lawnmower outside, but I don't have any control of that. <laughs> He's right up under the window. But uh, this is the uh, my room, and you can see I've collected some cigarette letters I'll tell you about later. But the quarters are quite comfortable, and they've been renovated. This is outside ours. The, the birds own it. Uh, so uh, you can see it's Charlie Barracks, and Wyland was there, painted a very nice mural on the wall, along with Sylvia Earle and... Um, the birds are, get to park wherever they want. So here's why we're there. We, it's, this is Laysan albatrosses, native albatross to Hawaii uh, and the Northern Pacific. And most of them, I think, I, I don't know the percentage, but almost all of them nest it, at Midway and in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. We have a few here on Oahu that's growing, fortunately, but most of them are here. They're magnificent flyers. They have about a seven foot wingspan and um, their uh, partners who are black-footed albatrosses are quite a few fewer. There's only about 25,000 compared to 500,000 laysans. But the black-footed albatrosses are named blackfoots, but they're black all over. They have a little white on their faces, but mostly they're, they're black and they are not doing as well as the, the uh, laysan albatrosses because this is a species that likes to follow fishing boats and long liners and they dive on the bait as the uh, anglers are putting the bait into the water and drown. So it's kind of con concerning. Everyone's really interested in the count. So we count these two species. They also, they're a little bigger than the laysans and they have about a seven and a half to eight foot wingspan. They're flying all over the place. They're magnificent flyers. They're spent uh, uh, most of their life at sea really. Uh, and, but you have to be careful because they're not great landers. So because they, they sometimes crash land, uh, they sometimes run into you. So when you're riding around, you have to be careful and keep your eye out so you can swerve to get out of the way of one that's sort of uh, looking for a good place to land. You can see there's not a lot of space. Once the birds land, they uh, get together, the young ones get together at, in, in little groups and they start singing and dancing for a mate. And this is, uh, they mate for life, so this is a really important song and dance. They are uh, at sea for the first three to four years of their life. They never come ashore after they're fledged, and then their hormones start, start in, and they come in uh, three to four years, and then they do these songs and dances with each other, sometimes in groups of three or four, and usually it ends up with just two. And if the song and dance is right to each other, then they, um, they pair up, and this is one, uh, one of the behaviors. Uh, there's dozens of steps and songs, and it's one of the behaviors called sky pointing that they, um, that they do, and it's, it's a joy and a pleasure to watch and hear. It goes on all day and all night long. This is the Blackfoots, and they, uh, the cute thing about them is they stand on their tiptoes when they dance. 
So once they are mated, once they have uh, established a pair bond, they groom each other. And it's a very affectionate, charming kind of thing to watch. I think the, the uh, mostly only the young ones do this. Once they're an older couple, they live, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. They don't, they don't do this too much, but in the, the young ones, you see this doing quite a bit and you think, well, they've met their match and they're, and they're happy and, and grooming each other. So once they've uh, gotten together, they are very much a pair. They stay together until one dies. If one dies, the other one will stand there, come back to the nest, same nesting site year after year and uh, wait for the other one. It's kind of sad when you see one bird waiting, 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 and you know that it, its mate hasn't come back. But eventually, like Wisdom, the, the oldest bird that's ever been banded, um, I think she's 60 some years old now. She uh, waited, waited, didn't get her mate back and mated with somebody else. So she's had, I think, three, three, three or more mates now. And these are the black-footed albatrosses, very lovey. Uh, sometimes they get a little mixed up uh, in their in their mating frenzy. <laughs> They're singing and dancing, and then when they come back to mate, they sometimes mate with the wrong species. So then you get hybrids. And this year we saw quite a few hybrids of different shades. They're sometimes more black on one side and lighter on the other. And this one we saw look like it may have been second generation hybrid. So the hybrids do build nests and sit on eggs, and we're not really sure if they... Uh, are fertile probably because this one looks like it may be a second generation, but there have not been any studies on the hybrids yet. But they're beautiful and very noticeable. One of the things that's really fun to uh, be there and to, one of the reasons we fall in love with these birds is they're not afraid of us, like at all. <laughs> and so this, this is one of the researchers kind of explaining to one of her Blackfoots what she's doing, it's very cute. And this one just kind of sitting there while I took a rest from counting. You see I'm have clickers on the bottom, but they're, they're not afraid of us. And in fact, they're quite friendly and curious. The young ones are very curious. And my friend had given me these socks with squid on them as a, as a, a, a gift to take to Midway. And we always make, make a joke that this albatross saw the squid and was going for it. It's one of their food, but of course not. It's probably the colors. But um, as I was sitting there taking a picture, the same birds start pecking at the camera. So these are great pictures, but they're not very hard to get because <laughs> the birds are right in your face, the young ones especially. The, the older ones are busy raising chicks. Uh, albatrosses build nests on, at Midway and in their nesting places just about anywhere they want. This one uh, pretty much close to where they were hatched. So uh, 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 no one knows for sure because you'd have to do DNA studies, but uh, we think that most of the birds in one area are probably related. This one made a nest in the middle of the road, just put up a sign and went around it. Uh, most of them are sand nests, very elaborate, but once the chicks hatch, this is only for incubating the egg. Once the chicks hatch, they kind of wander around and the nests aren't really useful anymore. Um, this one <laughs> built a nest in a vegetable garden, so they just rope, they just put a little fence around it to keep the chick and the and the uh, adults from tromping around in the garden. But they pretty much have the run of the place. I like this nest because it's so elaborate. This bird picked up things off the runway and made quite an elaborate. These are um, ironwood tree seeds and you know sticks and stones. And of course they nest in the houses. <laughs> they, they have the flower beds if they want them and, and they're, they're quite a nice yard decoration. They don't care about trash. You know, people get really upset about uh, trash and one of the reasons I really wanted to give this talk is because when I wear my Midway t-shirt which I have on people say why do you go to Midway when all the birds are dead well they're certainly not all dead but that is definitely the impression we get because we often see pictures of dead albatrosses uh, with plastic in them but uh, I'll talk a little more about that later but the birds don't care they pretty much nest where they want they nest around where they either uh, hatched or near where they hatched and near where they found a mate. And so here's five, six, seven, eight, all in, in this uh, trash pit, which I think looks to me, we, we don't know for sure, this was on Eastern Island, that a wave had washed up a bunch of trash from the beach, maybe over some time. And, and this is almost all the trash from the beach. And here's one right in the middle of a, a, another wave washed uh, trash heap. 
people try to pick it up, but it's a losing battle. And this bird, we all felt bad about this picture, but one of the seabird biologists said, no, no, this is a young one just practicing. So what they do is they find a rock or a, a golf ball. When the Navy was there, they had to, and had a golf course, they had to use different colored golf balls because the birds would go over and sit on the white ones. So the, um, the birds sometimes that are practicing, they've got these hormones to reproduce and to mate, and they don't have an egg, they'll just practice sitting on, th on things. This is a discarded fishing plate. Once they do uh, lay an egg, they mate, lay an egg, uh, the female flies off to, to eat, and the male usually takes the first turn of incubation, and they talk to it. So when the chick hatches, the parent and the chick know each other, which is an amazing thing, that they talk to the eggs. They are always standing up talking to them and they have a special voice. So it's just a little, eh, eh, eh. you can hear them talking to the chick and um, wondering, we all wonder if the chick's talking back. And this black-footed albatross is actually talking to its chick as it's hatching. So you see the little uh, um, hole there, that's the, ch the chick hatching. So we left, left it alone and came back and there's the little baby. So what we do at, as counting, the count's been going on, uh, I think since the mid 1990s. And I went in the late 1990s my first time. But it's evolved now. So this is the only place that you actually do a head count. On counts in other seabird colonies, you, you count an area, a few areas, and then you extrapolate the numbers. But this is, this is one of the few places we count every bird. We try to count every bird. And so if you keep that going, you have really accurate counts and you can't really change it in the middle you know, there's drones and other things now that we could maybe think of using and people are definitely thinking of it. But if you change the system in the middle of the, of a 20 years, 30 year study, uh, you, you changed the way you're doing it and you, then you don't have the same numbers. So a team goes out ahead of the rest of us and the red brick is marking an areas that we're gonna count. So we have sections. So we get together when we're all there and we talk every in the morning, each morning about which section which team is gonna take for the day. And then that's where we go. This one, of course, was having an albatross visit us during our meeting, very typical. And then you get bicycles, Every, everybody gets a bike, you ride bikes, the island's about two miles by three miles, so it's very uh, rideable, except when it's blown 30 knots, it's a little hard to get upwind, but we all have our own bikes. And then we get out there and we start the count. And the way we count is we have six people to a team, uh, each side, on each end of the team has a, a paint gun. And so they paint as they walk so they know where they went. Then we pinwheel around and go back on the other side's paint uh, mark. And so you just go back and forth through the colonies. And uh, what we do, the way we're counting is we say, look left or look right. And so we're, we're all looking right. And so uh, this counter is counting all the birds between himself and and her, so they, you know, so they, so you have to stay in line. So if you get ahead of the line or behind the line, everyone has to wait. So it really takes a lot of concentration. I don't have a lot of pictures of this because I'm always in it, and you, we're not shooting many pictures. It's it's pretty uh, concentrated work. It's not hard work, but you have to pay attention. So as they move forward, they he would count one, two, three, click, 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 and then and then the line just keeps moving. But uh, it's very efficient, and it's. And it's, uh, it's really a lot of fun because you get to be so close to the birds and see all the behaviors. These are the, the paint guns and the, um, the non-toxic marking paint that we use, which washes off in the rain. So the big rub here, and the reason we have snowshoes is that there's burrows throughout the island. In 1996, Midway was eradicated from rats. And so um, the bone and petrels have returned and um, bone and petrels have returned because there's no rats. The rats were getting in the burrows and eating them and they've returned by almost a million. There's no count, but the whole place is riddled with bone and petrel burrows. And they're, and they're often quite deep. They're often, uh, if you put your arm in, they can be up to your armpit. And so the problem is you don't, there's, there's a condominium. <laughs> they, they even burrow under the albatross nest, but they, you don't know how far or which direction exactly the burrow went. So you get a clue that this burrow goes this way and you can step here, but you don't really know where to step there. And if you, if you um, here's a bone and 
digging. So they dig not just in the sand, but in the grass. So if you step on that and it collapses, um, you have to dig out the, the bird. And this is just a picture of me. They get in the house, they get in the uh, barracks sometimes in the hallway because they're attracted to light. We try to keep the lights up, but I, I put this in so you can see how big they are. They're very charming, not really sweet little birds. And they've got these amazing feet. So they just dig like crazy and the sand goes flying. It looks like a dog digging on the beach. And so when, if you fall in, you have to dig, dig out the burrow where you fell and then re, re dig it yourself and kind of make it so you can make sure that the bird can get in and out because they probably go back to the same burrow each year too. But it got to a point where we couldn't even walk through the, the, um, the albatross colonies. So we tried snowshoes and it really, really helped this year. Craig and I bought our own snowshoes, a lightweight aluminum and donated them to the refuge for future counts. And these are plastic snowshoes that are kids, kids. And so everyone was kind of trying to see what worked best. They both worked fine. But as you could see in that early picture, the plastic ones picked up rocks and got really full of stuff and made it harder to walk. So uh, that's the way now that you can walk through the colony and not fall through the burrows. It does have its challenges. This is Martha on her hands and knees crawling under the fallen ironwood trees in snowshoes is tough. And of course there's a bird coming up saying, what, what's going on here, who are you? It's, uh, it's really a lot of fun, but, but it's really hard work. I, I'd like to warn people who are, want to volunteer that not only is it a little expensive, it, it's quite hard work and you're out there. Sometimes uh, I had my phone this year, we walked eight to 10 miles a day. And so if you're not a strong walker um, and you can't bend down and dig out burrows, you don't want to do it. And you also have to be out in the all weather. Um, Midway's about 28 degrees north, 1200 north is quite a bit cooler than here. The average temperature in the winter is about 70 degrees when we're there, and so it's colder. And of course, you work in the rain. Although there's lots of nice days too. So uh, we have Christmas Day and New Year's Day off. It usually goes over um, the holidays because that's the best time for uh, people to go, but also because of the birds have not, have all laid their eggs, but they're not hatched yet. So sometimes the uh, Fish and Wildlife Managers take us out on the boat uh, to the edge of the atoll, which is, you know, really big, exciting day for us all. And because it's protected, there's an amazing marine life there. This is a Triton's trumpet, which we don't see around the main islands anymore. So um, the other good thing that's happened at Midway, besides the albatrosses doing well, is that the uh, sea turtles have come there since the Navy's gone. And so no one really knows why or what's happening, but we counted uh, 50 turtles basking on the beach in one, one time, which was an amazing, it's an amazing thing to see. They're not nesting there yet, but they probably will soon. Uh, there's a manager out there right now who's, uh, I talked to him this week and he said he's doing uh, tagging, so they'll be able to see who's who. The other great thing out there is other species. It's not just, it seems like only albatrosses when you're in the middle of a million of them, but the uh, white terns are there. And this one is uh, incubating a golf ball that, there's still golf balls occasionally uh, around and you can see them on the, one of the workers or collect them when they're out. But uh, this white turn just flew down and sat on one. So it's a really fun place to work. And uh, as I said, one of the reasons I wanted to really spread the word about how great Midway is, is because this is what most people see. And this is why so many people have said to me, why do you go when all the birds are dead? Well, uh, I have some things to say about that. <laughs> And I, I, I see another side of it. Those of you who've been reading my column over the years know that I do try to see the bright side because there are definitely bright sides, but that's usually not what we see in the news. So um, this is what the pictures uh, that we see, and this is one of mine, it certainly happens. Plastic is certainly not good for the birds, but this is another couple pictures I took. They die anyway. Uh, the really good fledging years, 60% of the birds hatched the chicks that hatch actually fly away. So they have other things that kill them. They don't get enough food or they, they succumb to the heat. It gets really hot. They don't have shade. There's, there's all kinds of things that happen. So uh, a 60% fledging rate is great, which means 40% die. And this was, no one knows if they're dying from plastic specifically. Probably some are, but not all. And one of the reasons that um, they're adapted 
to in some ways to plastic is because they uh, they eat squid is one of their main. This is a really big one I found recently on the beach, but they're not usually this big that the albatrosses eat. But they eat squid, and uh, the squid have beaks on, in between all those tentacles, and they're very sharp, uh, really sharp. They also eat flying fish eggs. It's a flying fish egg from the deck of my boat. And here's the, uh, some dried flying fish eggs, and that's there's the beak. You can see how sharp it is from a from the uh, squid. And so uh, when the parents pick up food, and that's why one of the biologists feel that the plastic often has flying fish eggs stuck to it because they uh, sink. They're not on something floating, which used to be pumice and driftwood and those things. Now they have plastic. The parent feeds it to the chick, and then the chicks eventually, normally, without plastic, throw up these things called boluses. And you can see they've got some uh, styrofoam. These have uh, fishing line, but but traditionally this is how they evolved to throw up the squid beaks, and that's those tooths in the center. And the squid beaks are sharp enough that they could puncture the the um, gastric intestinal system and also could kill the bird. But mostly they gather in their crop and then they throw them up when they're full. So we do see plastic pieces of plastic like this around all the nests. Uh, and that's stuff that the chick has thrown up. And whether it was in a bolus or not, the bolus is sort of disintegrate over, the, over time in the weather, but the plastic is left. And so you see this around there. And this is not, these are pieces that the parent picked up from sea, the sea, maybe with fish eggs on them, fed it to the chick and the chick threw them up. So this is not terrible news that you see this around there. It means that the chick's throwing them up. And the good news is um, we can't see that. Let's see if we can see the end of that um, graph. Oops. Oh, no. Let me go back there because that's important. Yeah, that's that's a better view. So this is Laysan albatross active nests that we count active nests. It's about five hundred thousand, as you can see, and that's two. Two birds, so that's a million. And then there's all the walkers and partiers, we call them the teenagers, and they're singing and dancing. And I, I, no one's counted them, but there's probably another million, and plus the chicks. So, so this graph shows that they, they're really doing quite well. Uh, and this is up to uh, uh, 2020. I just got this, uh, this last week from Fish and Wildlife Biologist who's studying them. And the nice thing is, uh, in 2015, which isn't that long ago, was a record number of albatross nests. And this is well after plastic has been a real problem for all seabirds. And it's not good for them, but they're not, you know, totally all dead for, by any means. And so here's the um, graph of the breeding pairs of albatross, the nests that we've counted. And you can see it's gradually on the increase, which is, is uh, great news. Now there's all other kinds of issues of global warming and the, you know, the islands getting inundated. They're all really close to sea level, but that's another thing. Right now they, they seem to be doing okay. This is the black-footed albatross count and there's uh, 20, only about 25,000, but they, they're pretty much holding their own also. The increase is um, not as much, but it's still a gradual increase. And so um, people are working really hard to get the, uh, fishing industry to help with the black-footed albatrosses. And they tend to nest on the edge of the atoll islands, which really get inundated. So they, they lose nests fairly often. So I'm gonna go back to the um, full slides because these are magnificent pictures. This is the third species of albatross. There used to be about 5 million. And now they're down, they got down to 10 in, in the 1940s through hunting and also a volcano blew up on their nesting island near Japan. They're called short-tailed albatrosses and their nickname is golden, golden goonies, because they have these beautiful colors, golden head and their big pink bills. And so the great thing is the short-tailed albatross pair, one pair arrived at Midway in October this year. The female laid an egg and the chick hatched in uh, January when I was there. So we all got to, at, some distance with big telephoto lenses. We all got to go out and see this chick of this extremely rare bird that, that is now coming to Midway. So it may be some time, and if Midway can survive the uh, ocean rise, 
sea level rise, um, and they have some uh, short tail albatrosses there, but they're, they're quite a bit bigger than the other two species. So this is a really exciting, wonderful thing for bird people. And it should be for everybody because it's a success story. We don't have that many. The other good thing is the plastic, um, the plastic pollution problem is really, really well known now. And people have done so much work with it and gotten the word out that plastic makers are really trying to it makes some biodegradable things. I read some studies about making uh, plastic-like things that will biodegrade, and so it can be our future if we really stay on it. The other good thing is the uh, state has put up a um, amnesty bin here for fishermen at Pier 39, and you can they can throw their fishing gear that they don't want anymore here instead of in the ocean, and so that's a great thing. And my big thing is we what we can do, we can't do much about the fishing gear that gets thrown in, but we can remember that we all eat fish and that we all have some culpability in the fishing industry because we eat fish. And so aquaculture may help that. It's not perfect, there's problems with it. I hear lots of people say, don't eat aquaculture fish. And I know that it's not great, but it may be part of the answer to some of the fishing gear problems. The other thing is water, bottled water is the biggest scam I think that has ever happened in my lifetime. It's just preposterous that people think they have to buy water. You know, you see people coming out of Costco with just enormous crates of water and I, I, I have no idea why except that they, they bought the hike, the, the advertising, because this is no better for us than tap water, especially here in Hawaii. But if you don't trust it and you don't want to drink it, please put a filter on your, at your house and fill up bottles. But this is what happens. This is one corner of one little piece of Midway. It, these bottles are, are just everywhere. And they, they've really, it's, it's something we can do. That's one of the things I think we can do. I asked a woman at Costco why she was buying all that water. And she said, because it's so convenient. And I said, well, isn't turning on the, on the faucet convenient? And she said, you're upsetting me. So people don't want to really hear it, but but I think it's our job as people who care about the environment and, and especially our wildlife to really try to just remind people that this is really not something they have to do. One time I saw two, one chick, I was out there during hatching time uh, when the chicks were pretty big, throw up two lighters at once, not, not in a bowl. I said, just like, erp, and the two lighters came down onto the ground. And so Gabe, I, I just thought these are, is, this plastic is amazing stuff. It's been at sea. It got discarded probably from fishing boats or from got down rivers and into the ocean and in the gyre and who knows where it all was. But it's still bright colors. It's still beautiful. It's still solid. And so I decided to collect the lighters and um, make something out of them as, a, as a, an art, art statement. And so it's become kind of fun when people count with me or not, and when they don't count with me, they know about it. They're all bending down, collecting lighters. We have our pockets bulging and little bags full of cigarette lighters. And I use them to, um, to uh, make albatross art pieces. And these are pretty big, but um, I make a poster to go along and that way I can get the, the word out about uh, the, the lighter sort of get people's attention. And then I made this poster that goes with the the lighter art that people can see that the albatrosses collected the lighters, fed them to the chicks, the chicks threw them up, and that's where I got them. So that's sort of a good, a good news story in, in one way. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say that this uh, art piece of albatrosses dancing and the poster is now at the East West Center at the University of Hawaii. So trying to get the word out, and that's an international uh, group of students and so um, sort of move it around to different places to, to get the story out about albatrosses. So that's what I have for uh, my story. I left out a lot of things about Midway and um, I'm really happy to be able to continue this even though I thought we weren't. And so uh, there's a lot of good news. It's not, the birds are not all dead. And um, there's lots of things we can still do to, to help them in the future. So if you want to contact me, I, my name is Susan Scott. Uh, this is my email, and I have two websites now. One's uh, called coleaaccount.org for a Colea project I'm working on. Um, 
And this is my own website. And I am a board member of the Hawaii Audubon Society and um, speaking for Audubon today. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for all the wonderful emails you've written me since my column is no longer going to be in the newspaper. Uh, it's hard times for everybody, so including the newspapers. So don't blame them. Uh, if you want to ask me questions or comment, please email me at the top address or uh, get, at, get to me through the contacts links on these two sites. So thanks for your time.